Hi, my sweet friends, and welcome back to Crochet Every Day with Judy. We're reading again from Jane Eyre. Today we're starting with chapter 22. Mr. Rochester had given me but one week's leave of absence, yet a month elapsed before I acquitted Gateshead. I wished to leave immediately after the funeral, but Georgiana entreated me to stay till she could get off to London, whither she was now at last invited by her uncle, Mr. Gibson, who had come down to direct her sister's interment and settle the family affairs. Georgiana said she dreaded being left alone with Eliza. From her, she got neither sympathy, sympathy in her dejection, support in her fears, nor aid in her preparations. So I bore with her feeble-minded wailings and selfish lamentations as well as I could, and did my best in sewing for her and packing her dresses. It is true that while I worked, she would idle. And I thought to myself, if you and I were destined to live always together, cousin, we would commence matters on a different footing. I should not settle tamely down into being the forbearing party. I should assign you your share of labor and compel you to accomplishment, or else it should be left undone. I should insist also on your keeping some of those drawling, half-insincere complaints hushed in your own breast. It is only because our connection happens to be very transitory and comes at a peculiarly mournful season that I consent thus to render it so patient and compl compliant on my part. At last, I saw Georgiana off, but now it was Eliza's turn to request me to stay another week. Her plans required all her time and attention, she said. She was about to depart for some unknown bourne, and all day long she stayed in her own room, her door bolted within, filling trunks, emptying drawers, burning papers, and holding no communication with anyone. She wished me to look after the house to see callers and answer notes of condolence. One morning she told me I was at liberty, and she added, I am obliged to you for your valuable services and discreet conduct. There is some difference between living with such an one as you and with Georgiana. You perform your own part in life and burden no one. Tomorrow, she continued, I set out for the continent. I shall take up my abode in a religious house near Lyle. A nunnery, you would call it. There I shall, I shall be quiet and unmolested. I shall re devote myself for a time to the examination of the Roman Catholic dogmas and to a careful study of the workings of their system. If I find it to be, as I half suspect it is, the one best calculated to ensure the doing of all things decently and in order, I shall embrace the tenets of Rome and probably take the veil. I neither expressed surprise at this resolution nor attempted to dissuade her from it. The vocation will fit you to a hair, I thought. Much good may it do you. When we parted, she said, Goodbye, Cousin Jane Eyre. I wish you well. You have some sense. I then returned, you are not without sense, Cousin Eliza, but what you have, I suppose, in another year will be walled up alive in a French convent. However, it is not my business, and so it suits you. I don't much care. You are in the right, said she, and with these words we each went our separate way. As I shall not have occasion to refer either to her or her sister again, I may as well mention here that Georgiana made an, adva an advantageous match with a wealthy, worn-out man of fashion, and that Eliza actually took the veil and is at this day superior of the convent where she passed the period of her novitiate at which she endowed with her fortune. How people feel when they are returning home from an absence, long or short, I did not know. I had never experienced the sensation. I had known what it was to come back to Gateshead when a child, after a long walk, to be scolded for looking cold or gloomy, and later what it was to come back from church to Lowood, to long for a plenteous meal and a good fire, and to be unable to get either. Neither of these returnings was very pleasant or desirable. No magnet drew me to a given point, increasing in its strength of attraction the nearer I came. The return to Thornfield was yet to be tried. <clears throat> My journey seemed tedious, very tedious. Fifty miles one day, a night spent at an inn, fifty miles the next day. During the first twelve hours, I thought of Mrs. Reed in her last moments. I saw her disfigured and discolored face and heard her strangely altered voice. I mused on the funeral day, the coffin, the hearse, the black train of tenants and servants. Few was the number of relatives, the gaping vault, the silent church, the solemn service. Then I thought of Eliza and Georgiana. I beheld one the cynosure of a ballroom, the other the inmate of a convent cell and I dwelt on and analyzed their separate peculiarities of person and character. The evening arrival at the great town scattered these thoughts. Night gave them quite another turn. Laid down on my traveler's bed, I left reminiscence for anticipation. I was going back to Thornfield, but how long was I to stay there? Not long, of that I was sure. I had heard from Mrs. Fairfax in the interim of my absence. The party at the hall was dispersed. Mr. Rochester had left for London three weeks ago, but he was then expected to return in a fortnight. Mrs. Fairfax surmised that he was gone to make arrangements for his wedding, as he had talked of purchasing a new carriage. She said that the idea of his marrying Miss Ingram still seemed strange to her, but from what everybody said and from what she had herself seen, she could no longer doubt that the event would shortly take place. 
You would be strangely incredulous if you did doubt it, was my mental comment. I don't doubt it. The question followed, where was I to go? I dreamt of Miss Ingram all the night. In a vivid morning dream, I saw her closing the gates of Thornfield against me and pointing me out another road. And Mr. Rochester looked on with his arms folded, smiling sardonically, as it seemed, at both her and me. I had not notified to Mrs. Fairfax the, ad the exact day of my return, for I did not wish either car or carriage to meet me at Millcote. I proposed to walk the distance quietly by myself, and very quietly, after leaving my box in the os ostler's care, did I slip away from the George Inn about six o'clock of a June evening and take the old road to Thornfield, a road which lay chiefly through fields and was now little frequented. It was not a bright or splendid summer evening, though fair and soft. The haymakers were at work all along the road, and the sky, though far from cloudless, was such as promised well for the future. Its blue, where blue was visible, was mild and settled, and its cloud strata high and thin. The west, too, was warm. No watery gleam chilled it. It seemed as if there was a fire lit, an altar burning behind its screen of marbled vapor, and out of aperture shone of gold redness. I felt glad as the road shortened before me. So glad that I stopped once to ask myself what that joy meant, and to remind reason that it was not to my home I was going, or to a permanent resting place, or to a place where fond friends looked out for me and waited my arrival. Mrs. Fairfax will smile you a calm welcome, to be sure, said I, and little Adele will clap her hands and jump to see you, but you know very well you are not thinking of another than they. I'm sorry, but you know very well you are thinking of another than they, and that he is not thinking of you. But what is so headstrong as youth? What so blind as inexperience? These affirmed that it was pleasure enough to have the privilege of again looking on Mr. Rochester, whether he looked on me or not, and they added, hasten, hasten, be with him while you may, but a few more days or weeks at most, and you are parted from him forever. And then I strangled a newborn agony, a deformed thing which I could not persuade myself to own and rear and ran on. They are making hay, too, in Thornfield Meadows, or rather, the laborers are just quitting their work and returning home with their rakes on their shoulders, now at the hour I arrive. <clears throat> I have but a field or two to, tra to traverse, and then I shall cross the road and reach the gates. How full the hedges are of roses! But I have no time to gather any. I want to be at the house. I pass the tall briar, shooting leafy and flowery branches across the path. I see the narrow stile with stone steps, and I see Mr. Rochester sitting there, a book and a pencil in his hand. He is writing. Well, he is not a ghost, yet every nerve I have is unstrung. For a moment I am beyond my own mastery. What does it mean? I did not think I should tremble in this way when I saw him, or lose my voice or the power of motion in his presence. I will go back as soon as I can stir. I need not make an absolute fool of myself. I know another way to the house. It does not signify if I knew twenty ways, for he has seen me. Hello, he cries, and puts up his book and his pencil. There you are. Come on, if you please. I suppose I do come on, though in what fashion I know not. Being scarcely cognizant of my movements, and solicitous only to appear calm, and above all to control the working muscles of my face, which I feel rebel insolently against my will, and struggle to express what I had resolved to conceal. But I have a veil. It is down. I may make shift yet to behave with decent composure. And this is Jane Eyre? Are you coming from Millcote and on foot? Yes, just one of your tricks, not to send for a carriage and come clattering over street and road like a common mortal, but to steal into the vicinage of your home along with twilight, just as if you were a dream or a shade. What the deuce have you done with yourself this last month? I have been with my aunt, sir, who is dead. A true Janian reply. Good angels, be my guard. She comes from the other world, from the abode of people who are dead, and tells me so when she meets me alone here in the gloaming. If I dared, I'd touch you to see if you are substance or shadow, you elf. But I'd as soon offer to take hold of a blue ignis fatus light in a march, in a marsh. Truant, truant, he added, when he had paused an instant. Absent from me a whole month and forgetting me quite, I'll be sworn. I knew there would be pleasure in meeting my master again, even though broken by the fear that he was so soon to cease to be my master, and by the knowledge that I was nothing to him. But there was ever in Mr. Rochester, so at least I thought, such a wealth of the power of communicating happiness, that to taste but of the crumbs he scattered to stray in stranger birds like me was to feast genially. His last words were balm. They seemed to imply that it imported something to him whether I forgot him or not, and he had spoken of Thornfield as my home. Would that it were my home. He did not leave the stile, and I hardly liked to ask to go by. I inquired soon if he had not been to London. Yes, I suppose you found that out by second sight. Mrs. Fairfax told me in a letter. And did she inform you what I went to do? Oh, yes, sir. Everybody knew your errand. 
You must see the carriage, Jane, and tell me if you don't think it will suit Mrs. Rochester exactly, and whether she won't look like Queen Boadicea leaning back against those purple cushions. I wish, Jane, I were a trifle better adapted to match with her externally. Tell me now, fairy as you are, can't you give me a charm or a filter or something of that sort to make me a handsome man? It would be past the power of magic, sir, and in thought, I added, a loving eye is all the charm needed. To such you are handsome enough, or rather your sternness has a power beyond beauty. Mr. Rochester had sometimes read my unspoken thoughts with an acumen to me incomprehensible. In the present instance, he took no notice of my abrupt vocal response, but he smiled at me with a certain smile he had of his own, and which he used but on rare occasions. He seemed to think it too good for common purposes. It was the real sunshine of feeling he shed it over me now. Pass, Janet, said he, making room for me to cross the stile. Go up home and stay your weary little wandering feet at a friend's threshold. All I had now to do was to obey him in silence. No need for me to call a quise further. I got over the stile without a word and meant to leave him calmly. An impulse held me fast. A force turned me round. I said, or something in me said for me and in spite of me, thank you, Mr. Rochester, for your great kindness. I am strangely glad to get back again to you. And wherever you are is my home, my only home. I walked on so fast that even he could hardly have overtaken me had he tried. Little Adele was half wild with delight when she saw me. Mrs. Fairfax received me with her usual pl plain friendliness. Leah smiled, and even Sophie bid me bonsoir with glee. This was very pleasant. There is no happiness like that of being loved by your fellow creatures and feeling that your presence is an addition to their comfort. I that evening shut my eyes resolutely against the future. I stopped my ears against the voice that kept warning me of near separation and coming grief. When tea was over and Mrs. Fairfax had taken her knitting and I had assumed a low seat near her and Adele, kneeling on the carpet, had nestled close up to me and a sense of mutual affection seemed to surround us with a ring of golden peace, I uttered a silent prayer that we might not be parted far or soon, but when as we thus sat, Mr. Rochester entered unannounced and looking at us seemed to take pleasure in the spectacle of a group so amicable when he said he supposed the old lady was all right now that she had got her adopted daughter back again and added that he saw Adele was prête à croquer sa petite maman anglaise. I half ventured to hope that he would, even after his marriage, keep us together somewhere under the shelter of his protection and not quite exiled from the sunshine of his presence. A fortnight of dubious calm succeeded my return to Thornfield Hall. Nothing was said of the master's marriage, and I saw no preparation going on for such an event. Almost every day I asked Mrs. Fairfax if she had yet heard anything decided. Her answer was always in the negative. Once she said she had actually put the question to Mr. Rochester as to when he was going to bring his bride home, but he had answered her, answered her only by a joke and one of his queer looks, and she could not tell what to make of him. One thing specially surprised me, and that was there were no journeyings backward and forward, no visits to Ingram Park. To be sure, it was twenty miles off on the borders of another county, but what was that distance to an ardent lover? To so practiced and indefatigable a horseman as Mr. Rochester, it would be but a morning's ride. I began to cherish hopes I had no right to conceive, that the match was broken off, that rumor had been mistaken, that one or both parties had changed their minds. I used to look at my master's face to see if it were sad or fierce, but I could not remember the time when it had been so uniformly clear of clouds or evil feelings. If in the moments I and my pupil spent with him I lacked spirits and sank into inevitable dejection, he became even gay. Never had he called me more frequently to his presence, never been kinder to me when there, and alas, never had I loved him so well. Chapter 23 a splendid midsummer shone over England, skies so pure, suns so radiant as were then seen in long succession, seldom favor even singly our wave-girt land. It was as if a band of Italian days had come from the south, like a flock of glorious passenger birds, and lighted to rest them on the cliffs of Albion. The hay was all got in, the fields round Thornfield were green and shorn, the roads white and baked. The trees were in their dark prime, hedge and wood full-leaved and deeply tinted, contrasted well with the sunny hue of the cleared meadows between. On Midsummer Eve, Adele, weary with gathering wild strawberries and haylane half the day, had gone to bed with the sun. I watched her drop asleep, and when I left her, I sought the garden. It was now the sweetest hour of the twenty-four. Day its fervid fires had wasted, and dew fell cool on panting plain and scorched summit. Where the sun had gone down in simple state, pure of the pomp of clouds, spread a solemn purple, burning with the light of red jewel and furnace flame at one point, on one hill peak, and extending high and wide, soft and still softer, over half heaven. 
The east had its own charm of fine deep blue and its own modest gem, a rising and solitary star. Soon it would boast the moon, but she was yet beneath the horizon. I walked a while in the pavement, but a subtle, well-known scent, that of a cigar, stole from some window. I saw the library casement open a hand breath. I knew I might be watched then, so I went apart into the orchard. No nook in the grounds, more sheltered and more Eden-like. It was full of trees. It bloomed with flowers. A very high wall shut it out from the court on one side. On the other, a beach avenue screened it from the lawn. At the bottom was a sunk fence, its sole separation from lonely fields. A winding walk bordered with laurels and terminating in a giant horse chestnut circled at the base by a seat led down to the fence. Here one could wander unseen. While such honeydew fell, such silence reigned, such gloaming gathered, I felt as if I could haunt such shade forever. But in threading the flower and fruit parterres at the upper part of the enclosure, enticed there by the light the now rising moon cast on this more open quarter, my step is stayed, not by sound, not by sight, but once more by a warning fragrance. Sweetbriar and southernwood, jasmine, pink, and rose have long been yielding their evening sacrifice of incense. This new scent is neither of shrub nor flower, it is, I know it well, it is Mr. Rochester's cigar. I look round and I listen. I see trees laden with ripening fruit. I hear a nightingale warbling in a wood half a mile off. No moving form is visible, no coming step audible, but that perfume increases. I must flee. I make for the wicket leading to the shrubbery and I see Mr. Rochester entering. I step aside into the ivy recess. He will not stay long. He will soon return whence he came. And if I sit still, he will never see me. But no, eventide is as pleasant to him as to me, and this antique garden is attractive, and he strolls on, now lifting the gooseberry tree branches to look at the fruit, large as plums, with which they are laden, now taking a ripe cherry from the wall, now stooping toward a knot of flowers, either to inhale their fragrance or to admire the dewbeads on their petals. A great moth goes humming by me. It alights on a plant at Mr. Rochester's foot. He sees it and bends to examine it. Now he has his back toward me, thought I, and he is occupied too. Perhaps if I walk softly, I can slip away unnoticed. I trod on an edging of turf that the crackle of the pebbly gravel might not betray me. He was standing among the beds at the yard or two distant from where I had to pass. The moth apparently engaged him. I shall get by very well, I meditated. As I crossed his shadow thrown long over the garden by the moon not yet risen high, he said quietly without turning, Jane, come and look at this fellow. I had made no noise. He had not eyes behind. Could his shadow feel? I started at first, and then I approached him. Look at his wings, said he. He reminds me rather of a West Indian insect. One does not often see too large and gay a night rover in England. There, he has flown. The moth roamed away. I was sheepishly returning, all, retreating also. But Mr. Rochester followed me, and when we reached the wicket, he said, Turn back. On so lovely a night, it is, it is a shame to sit in the house, and surely no one can wish to go to bed while sunset is thus at meeting with moonrise. It is one of my faults that though my tongue is sometimes prompt enough at an answer, there are times when it sadly fails me in framing an excuse, and always the lapse occurs at some crisis when a facile word or plausible pretext is specially wanted to get me out of painful embarrassment. I did not like to walk at this hour alone with Mr. Rochester in the shadowy orchard, but I could not find a reason to allege for leaving him. I followed with lagging step and thoughts busily bent on discovering a means of extrication. But he himself looked so composed and so grave also, I became ashamed of feeling any confusion. The evil, if evil existent or perspective there was, seemed to lie with me only. His mind was unconscious and quiet. Jane, he recommenced as we entered the laurel walk and slowly strayed down in the direction of the sunk fence and the horse chestnut. Thornfield is a pleasant place in summer, is it not? Yes, sir. You must have become in some degree attached to the house. You who have an eye for natural beauties and a good deal of the organ of adhesiveness. I am attached to it indeed. And though I don't comprehend how it is, I perceive you have acquired a degree of regard for that foolish little child Adele, too, and even for simple Dame Fairfax. Yes, sir. In different ways, I have an affection for both. And would be sorry to part with them? Yes, Pity, said he said, and sighed and paused. It is always the way of events in this life, he continued presently. No sooner have you got settled in a pleasant resting place than a voice calls out to you to rise and move on, for the hour of repose is expired. Must I move on, sir? I asked. Must I leave Thornfield? I believe you must, Jane. I am sorry, Janet, but I be believe indeed you must. This was a blow, but I did not let it prostrate me. Well, sir, I shall be ready when the order to march comes. 
It has come now. I must give it tonight. Then you are going to be married, sir? Exactly, precisely. With your usual acuteness, you have hit the nail straight on the head. Soon, sir? Very soon. My, that is, Miss Eyre, and you'll remember, Jane, the first time I, or rumor, plainly intimated to you that it was my intention to put my old bachelor's neck into the sacred noose to enter into the holy estate of matrimony. To take Miss Ingram to my bosom, in short, she's an extensive armful, but that's not to the point. One can't have too much of such a very excellent thing as my beautiful Blanche. Well, as I was saying, listen to me, Jane. You're not turning your head to look after more moths, are you? That was only a lady clock child flying away home. I wish to remind you that it was you who first said to me, with that discretion I respect in you, with that foresight, prudence, and humility which befit your responsible and dependent position, that in case I married Miss Ingram, both you and little Adele had better uh, trot forthwith. I pass over the sort of slur conveyed in this suggestion on the character of my beloved. Indeed, when you are far away, Janet, I'll try to forget it. I shall notice only its wisdom, which is such that I have made it my law of action. Adele must go to school, and you, Miss Eyre, must get a new situation. Yes, sir, I will advertise immediately, and meantime, I suppose, I was going to say, I suppose I may stay here till I find another shelter to betake myself to. But I stopped, feeling it would not do to risk a long sentence, for my voice was not quite under command. In about a month, I hope to be a bridegroom, continued Mr. Rochester, and in the interim, I shall myself look out for employment and an asylum for you. Thank you, sir. I am sorry to give. Oh, no need to apologize. I consider that when a dependent does her duty as well as you have done yours, she has a sort of claim upon her employer for any little assistance he can conveniently render her. Indeed, I have already, through my future mother-in-law, heard of a place that I think will suit. It is to undertake the education of the five daughters of Mrs. Dionysius O'Gall of Bitternut Lodge, Connaught, Ireland. You'll like Ireland, I think. There's such warm-hearted people there, they say. It is a long way off, sir. No matter, a girl of your sense will not object to the voyage or the distance. Not the voyage, but the distance, and then the sea is a barrier. From what, Jane? From England, and from Thornfield, and... Well, from you, sir. I said this almost involuntarily, and with as little sanction of free will, my tears gushed out. I did not cry so as to be heard, however. I avoided sobbing. The thought of Mrs. O'Gall and Bitternut Lodge struck cold to my heart, and colder the thought of all the brine and foam, destined, as it seemed, to rush between me and the master at whose side I now walked, and coldest the remembrance of the wider ocean. Wealth, caste, custom intervened between me and what I naturally and inevitably loved. It is a long way, I again said. It is, to be sure, and when you get to Bitternut Lodge, Connaught, Ireland, I shall never see you again, Jane. That's morally certain. I never go over to Ireland, not having myself much of a fancy for the country. We have been good friends, Jane, have we not? Yes, sir. And when friends are on the eve of separation, they like to spend the little time that remains to them close to each other. Come, we'll talk over the voyage and the parting quietly half an hour or so while the stars enter into their shining life up in heaven yonder. Here is the chestnut tree. Here is the bench at its old roots. Come, we will sit there in peace tonight, though we should never more be destined to sit there together. He seated me and himself. It is a long way to Ireland, Janet, and I am sorry to send my little friend on such weary travels. But if I can't do better, how is it to be helped? Are you anything akin to me, do you think, Jane? I could risk no sort of answer by this time. My heart was still. Because, he said, I sometimes have a queer feeling with regard to you, especially when you are near me as now. It is as if I had a string somewhere under my left ribs, tightly and inextricably knotted to a similar string situated in the corresponding quarter of your little frame. And if that boisterous channel and 200 miles or so of land come broad between us, I am afraid that cord of communion will be snapped and then of a nervous notion I should take to bleeding inwardly. As for you, you'd forget me. That I never should, sir. You know, impossible to proceed. Jane, do you hear that nightingale singing in the wood? Listen. In listening, I sobbed convulsively, for I could repress what I endured no longer. I was obliged to yield, and I was shaken from head to foot with acute distress. When I did speak, it was only to express an impetuous wish that I had never been born or never come to Thornfield. Because you were sorry to leave it? The vehemence of emotion, stirred by grief and love within me, was claiming mastery and struggling for full sway, and asserting a right to predominate, to overcome, to live, rise and reign at last yes and to speak i grieve to leave thornfield i love thornfield i love it because i have lived in it a full and delightful life momentarily at least 
I have not been trampled on. I have not been petrified. I have not been buried with inferior minds and excluded from every, every glimpse of communion with what is bright and energetic and high. I have talked face to face with what I reverence, with what I delight in, with an original, a vigorous, and expanded mind. I have known you, Mr. Rochester, and it strikes me with terror and anguish to feel I absolutely must be torn from you forever. I see the necessity of departure, and it is like looking on the necessity of death. Where do you see the necessity? he asked suddenly. Where? You, sir, have placed it before me. In what shape? In the shape of Miss Ingram, a noble and beautiful woman, your bride. My bride? What bride? I have no bride. But you will have. Yes, I will. I will, he set his teeth. Then I must go. You have said it yourself. No, you must stay, I swear it, and the oath shall be kept. I tell you I must go, I retorted, roused to something like passion. Do you think I can stay to become nothing to you? Do you think I am an automaton, a machine without feelings, and can bear to have my morsel of bread snatched from my lips and my drop of living water dashed from my cup? Do you think because I am poor, obscure, plain, and little, I am soulless and heartless? You think wrong. I have as much soul as you and full as much heart. And if God had gifted me with some beauty and much wealth, I should have made it as hard for you to leave me as it is now for me to leave you. I am not talking to you now through the medium of custom, conventionalities, nor even of mortal flesh. It is my spirit that addresses your spirit, just as if both had passed through the grave and we stood at God's feet equal as we are. As we are, repeated Mr. Rochester. So, he added, enclosing me in his arms, gathering me to his breast, pressing his lips on my list. So, Jane. Yes, so, sir, I rejoined, and yet not so, for you are a married man, or as good as a married man, and wed to one inferior to you, to one with whom you have no sympathy, whom I do not believe you truly love, for I have seen and heard you sneer at her. I would scorn such a union, therefore I am better than you. Let me go. Where, Jane? To Ireland? Yes, to Ireland. I have spoken my mind and can go anywhere now. Jane, be still. Don't struggle so, like a wild, frantic bird that is rending its own plumage in its desperation. I am no bird and no net ensnares me. I am a free human being with an independent will, which I now exert to leave you. Another effort set me at liberty, and I stood erect before him. And your will shall decide your destiny, he said. I offer you my hand, my heart, and a share of all my possessions. You play a farce, which I merely laugh at. I ask you to pass through life at my side, to be my second self and best earthly companion. For that fate, you have already made your choice and must abide by it. Jane, be still a few moments. You are overexcited. I will be still, too. A waft of wind came sweeping down the laurel walk and trembled through, through the boughs of the chestnut. It wandered away, away, to an indefinite distance. It died. The nightingale song was then the only voice of the hour. In listening to it, I again wept. Mr. Rochester sat quiet, looking at me gently and seriously. Some time passed before he spoke. He at last said, Come to my side, Jane, and let us explain and understand one another. I will never again come to your side. I am torn away now and cannot return. But, Jane, I summon you as my wife. It is you only I intend to marry. I was silent. I thought he mocked me. Come, Jane, come hither. Your bride stands between us. He rose and with a stride reached me. My bride is here, he said, again drawing me to him. Because my equal is here in my likeness. Jane, will you marry me? Still I did not answer, and still I writhed myself from his grasp for I was still incredulous. Do you doubt me, Jane? Entirely. You have no faith in me? Not a whit. Am I a liar in your eyes? He asked passionately. Little skeptic, you shall be convinced. What love have I for Miss Ingram? None, and that you know. What love is she for me? None, as I have taken pains to prove. I caused a rumor to reach her that my fortune was not a third of what was supported, and after that I presented myself to see the result. It was coldness both from her and her mother. I would not, I could not marry Miss Ingram. You, you strange, you almost unearthly thing, I love as my own flesh. You, poor and obscure and small and plain as you are, I entreat to accept me as a husband. What, me, I said, beginning in his earnestness, and especially in his incivility, to credit his sincerity. Me, who have not a friend in the world but you, if you are my friend, not a shilling but what you have given me. You, Jane, I must have you for my own, entirely my own. Will you be mine? Say yes, quickly. Mr. Rochester, let me look at your face. Turn to the moonlight. Why? Because I want to read your countenance. Turn. There, you will find it scarcely more legible than a crumpled, scratched page. Read on, only make haste, for I suffer. His face was very much agitated and very much flushed, and there were strong workings in the features and strange gleams in the eyes. 
Oh, Jane, you torture me, he exclaimed. With that th searching and yet faithful and generous look, you torture me. How can I do that? If you are true and your offer real, my only feelings to you must be gratitude and devotion. They cannot torture. Gratitude, he said, and added wildly, Jane, accept me quickly. Say, Edward, give me my name. Edward, I will marry you. Are you in earnest? Do you truly love me? Do you sincerely wish me to be your wife? I do, and if an oath is necessary to satisfy you, I swear it. Then, sir, I will marry you. Edward, my little wife. Dear Edward, come to me. Come to me entirely now, said he, and added in his deepest tone, speaking in my ear as his cheek was laid on mine. Make my happiness. I will make yours. God pardon me, he subjoined ere long, and man meddle not with me. I have her and will hold her. There is no one to meddle, sir. I have no kindred to interfere. No, that is the best of it, he said, and if I had loved him less, I should have thought his accent and look of exultation savage, but sitting by him, roused from the nightmare of parting, called to the paradise of union, I thought only of the bliss given me to drink in so abundant a flow. Again and again, he said, Are you happy, Jane? And again and again, I answered, Yes, after which he murmured, It will atone, it will atone. Have I not found her friendless and cold and comfortless? Will I not guard and cherish and solace her? Is there not love in my heart and constancy in my resolves? It will expiate at God's tribunal. I know my maker sanctions what I do. For the world's judgment, I wash my hands thereof. For man's opinion, I defy it. But what had befallen the night? The moon was not yet set, and we were all in shadow. I could scarcely see my master's face, near as I was. And what ailed the chestnut tree? It writhed and groaned while wind rolled, wor roared in the laurel walk and came sweeping over us. We must go in, said Mr. Rochester. The weather changes. I could have sat till the, with thee till morning, Jane. And so, thought I, could I with you. I should have said so, perhaps. But a livid, vivid spark leapt out of a cloud at which I was looking, and there was a crack, a crash, and a close rattling peal. And I thought only of hiding my dazzled eyes against Mr. Rochester's shoulder. The rain rushed down. He hurried me up the walk through the grounds and into the house, but we were quite wet before we could pass the threshold. He was taking off my shawl in the hall and shaking the water out of my loosened hair when Mrs. Fairfax emerged from her room. I did not observe her at first, nor did Mr. Rochester. The lamp was lit. The clock was on the stroke of twelve. Hasten to take off your wet things, said he, and before you go, good night. Good night, my darling. He kissed me repeatedly. When I looked up on leaving his arms, there stood the widow, pale, grave, and amazed. I only smiled at her and ran upstairs. Explanation will do for another time, thought I. Still, when I reached my chamber, I felt a pang at the idea she should even temporarily misconstrue what she had seen. But joy soon effaced every other feeling, and loud as the wind blew, near and deep as the thunder crashed, fear, fierce and frequent as the lightning gleamed, cataract-like as the rain fell during a storm of two hours' duration, I experienced no fear and little awe. Mr. Rochester came thrice to my door in the course of it to ask if I was safe and tranquil, and that was comfort, that was strength for anything. Before I left my bed in the morning, little Adele came running in to tell me that the great horse chestnut at the bottom of the orchard had been, had been struck by lightning in the night, and half of it split away. We'll stop there and start next time with chapter 24. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.